Hi, I'm Barbara Friedberg, and I am here today talking with Brian Daly, the CEO and co-founder of Ground Floor. So welcome, Brian. Tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today. Sure. It's great to be with you. Uh, if you wind the clock back to 2012, I had just finished uh, turning over the keys to a wireless company that I started called Republic Wireless. And I was looking around to see what industry would I like to participate in next. I've been an investor since age 15 when my dad sent me to the library to learn about mutual funds. And I was very captivated by this legislation called the 2012 Jobs Act. And because of that, I was introduced to my co-founder, Nick Bargava, who is an expert in that legislation. He was part of a small group of people who uh, helped to author it and lobby for it, especially Title III, the equity crowdfunding part of that. And we met, hit it off, and found that we shared a common vision and started a company uh, three or four months later that became Ground Floor. And the rest is history. You you have just totally blow, blown my mind. And I feel like a complete idiot because, of course, I read your bio before I, I came on and I saw, oh, he worked at Republic Wireless for a while. That's kind of a strange jump. What I missed was that you founded Republic. That's that's pretty amazing. I was part of a small founding team there that, uh, you know, that bandwidth.com, the, the parent company, uh, sort of set up as an internal startup. And uh, there were a handful of us who got that started and came up with the concept and launched it and it caught fire and it's still operating and successful as a wireless company today. I know, of course. Well, let's get on to the legislation because that was the start of the crowdfunding movement. And for a lot of newer investors out here who know all the apps and the crowdfunding platforms, you guys, those weren't around before. Was it 2011 was the date? So yeah. tell us a little bit about what that legislation said and make it really interesting. Sure. Okay. And and yeah. how it spurred the crowdfunding movement. Well, it's interesting. Uh, when a lot of people think of crowdfunding, they think of Kickstarter or Indiegogo or Kiva, something like that. And the whole idea is an entrepreneur with a new product idea can put it out on one of these platforms and people can say, I'd like to buy that and I'll contribute toward that. And as a, as a supporter, you kind of get maybe one of the first versions of the product. And that was great. That kind of in the sort of 2005 to 2010 period started to kind of take off and people were into it. And it was a new source of financing, very exciting. What happened somewhere along the way is that one of the companies that was funded this way in the early days called Oculus, uh, which is an early sort of metaverse company, right? Virtual reality company uh, was bought by Facebook. And a lot of people looked around and they said, oh, cool. The product that we helped to finance in the beginning got bought. I guess I'm like a venture capitalist who's going to get paid, you know, for my shares. But the problem is you didn't own shares. <laughs> what you owned was a product <laughs> and that's it. And the only people who own shares were the people who founded the company and built the company and financed it, you know, uh, it, with equity capital. And so that was a wake up call to a lot of people. And there was a real movement to kind of open up those types of companies and those types of opportunities to the rest of us. I mean, hedge funds, private equity, family offices, accredited investors have always had access to private market opportunities like pre-IPO companies uh, or private real estate investments. And this part of the JOBS Act Title III of the Jobs Act in particular, and there's some other elements too, uh, were, were included in this legislation. It was a big piece of legislation passed by the Obama administration because of that pressure, right? The feeling was that capital markets should be open to everybody on equal terms, on equal footing. And so that was a pretty big moment, I think, for capital formation and investing in the United States. Yes, and it really has virtually changed the entire investment landscape. So how did Ground Floor, which is your company, how did that come about from that legislation? And how, first of all, tell us what it is. I mean, it sounds like yeah. an apartment. So ground, ground Floor allows you to participate in private market real estate loans that we make to real estate investors. Uh, you get to participate in these loans $10 at a time. You can build a portfolio of these loans that you know makes you a lender. 
right? You get to be in the same position as the bank. And that's a really good place to be. It's a very lucrative place to be. Uh, so it's a fractionalized investment offering. You invest $10 at a time. Most people invest about 100 to 200 per loan. It allows you, the technology allows you to build a big portfolio of loans uh, that you own. And the loans tend to repay in about 10 to 12 months on average. And they yield about 10 to 12% on average. So it's a very high yield, very short hold period. And because you have first lien position, just like a bank would, it's also very secure relative to similar types of investments. Now, back in the day, probably about 10 years ago, I personally invested in one of these crowdfunding platforms, a couple of them, actually. I'm not Great. mentioning any names. And I was totally thrilled because I was getting like 10 plus percent returns. Well, but then what happened, interest rates kind of started to dip a little bit. And all of a sudden I'm getting 5%, 4%, 3%. And I'm thinking I could be opera i could be owning more more highly rated bonds corporate bonds right yeah as opposed to that investment correct so where it where do you where does ground floor fit in when interest rates start to go back down how is you know how are you going to be able to say hey i've got a better higher yielding and equally as safe investment as say right. a a double a corporate bond so what's interesting about this space is that it has existed. These types of loans have existed for decades. Uh, they, it, it, it has always been a very lucrative form of lending. And the reason is, you know, we're making a loan to a real estate entrepreneur. This is somebody who's going to build a house, someone who's going to fix and flip a house, somebody who's going to build a rental portfolio of houses. And that is that itself, because you're adding value to a property, and you're building a product basically that somebody wants to buy. And we all know what's happened to housing prices over the last decade. Uh, because that is an economically valuable activity that uh, is very profitable for the people to whom we're lending, they are willing to pay very high yields in order to borrow money to allow them to do more of it. And if you think about it, if you and I were gonna go build a house and we said we were gonna split the profits, right? You'll be my financial partner. I'll be the operator doing the building. And at the end, we'll split the profits and the profits are say 40%, right? That's very expensive capital for me to access from you as my partner. If instead I can borrow it and only have to pay 10% or 12%, that's a big advantage financially. So that's why people do it. Now, if you're a borrower, you know that just like a bank, ground floor can foreclose. So if you're late or you don't do what you say you're going to do, or the project falls into default, we can take action just like the bank would to take that property back from you. Uh, and that's why people are a little wary about borrowing, right, on, on the riskier projects. I actually think that makes it a great investment product that no matter what happens with this interest rates, it's always going to perform well. No matter what happens with house prices, it's going to perform well. Because we as a lender can sort of make adjustments to reflect the market. That's a great thing about a short-term debt investment is we have a lot of opportunity to roll with the changes in the market. And that's what we've been doing over the last year or two in particular as rates have started to increase. Okay, so one of the things that you're saying is then every one of your loans is backed by real property. Correct. So we're not talking any personal loans no. or any guy or gal that wants to start up a new business, which unfortunately has a great uh, potential to fail. Correct. Real property is very reliable capital. When, so when we make a loan, we look at the value of the property as it is. We look at the value of the property at the end of the project after the improvements are made. We ask ourselves how much money it'll cost to get that done. And we look at the investor themselves, the entrepreneur, and we ask the question, can this person take this property, do this plan and get to this result? And if we believe it, and if there's enough profit margin for it to be worthwhile and lucrative for them, then we'll make the loan. If not, we won't. If we don't trust the prices, if we don't trust the plan, we don't trust the entrepreneur, then we don't make a loan. How many actual properties do you have in your portfolio right now? So we've made over time, we've made close to 4,000 loans. Okay, uh, we but, returned, but today, we if I were to go on your platform, how many could oh, I choose from? Oh, we have at any given time, we have about 100 that are currently funding. So we're adding probably 20 to 30 a week and they turn over because, you know, they fully fund. Uh, so, you know, you, you have to show up and you have to sort of pay attention and allocate into these loans. And we give you tools to pick and choose and you can robo invest into them by using our automated tools if you want to. Um, but at any given time, there's somewhere between 80 and 100 uh, live in funding. Now, Brian, I like the idea of how you vet your vet, your borrowers. That's really, really important. But 
when you're saying you have say, you know, 20 to 30 a week, that's pretty many, um, that's pretty many people to vet. Sure. Do you have the systems in place to act, actually check these guys and gals we out? We do. The first thing we do when we meet a new borrower who wants to do a deal with us is we ask them to submit their track record. So we say, tell us the addresses and the entities that you have you know, built or fixed and flipped before. Uh, and we check public records to make sure that they qualify for our best rates and that they're a good risk. We do that one time. And then every project that they want to do after that, we already know that about them, right? And we know how they've done with us. For us to go look at the value of the property and to look at the plan, we have it takes us about an hour uh, to do the analysis. Uh, and we have you know very talented people on staff who do that. And you know, we probably look at about 200 loan applications every month. We talk to borrowers probably about twice as many. So our originators talk to probably look at probably 400 deals a month. About 200 of them make it into the analysis phase, and about 100 of them end up being funded uh, in a, in a month. And how are you different? Because there are a lot of real estate crowdfunding there uh, platforms out there, there. Are. and competition is getting tougher. Now, yes. you only offer debt financing. Some of your competitors have debt and equity. Others have just uh, equity. What differentiates you? And There are three ways in which we're very different from anything else you'll find. Uh, number one, we are qualified by the Securities and Exchange Commission to offer securities to everyone, whether you're an accredited investor or not. And if you're how, in how did you get qualified to do that? Because that's a big deal. Some of your competitors are only open to accredited investors. And the for those of you- The majority of our investors yeah. are open to accredited investors only because there's no barrier to doing that. All you have to do is file a form with the SEC that says, hey, we have this offering and it's limited to accredited investors. It's a lot of work and expense. It took us about a million dollars in four years uh, $2 million all in to, to build the regulatory foundation that we have. But we did that because we as entrepreneurs aren't here just to open up more avenues for more wealthy people to put more money to work. We think the bigger need is for the other 95% of people who also deserve these opportunities in the level playing field. I will also tell you that another big differentiator is even if you're an accredited investor and you have all these choices, all these platforms, we're one of the only choices that's publicly regulated. You can, in fact, just last week, we uploaded our annual audited financial statements for the eighth year in a row. We have eight years, nine if you count the previous year that's included in the first filings, eight or nine years worth of filings where you can see exactly what our financials are, what the risk factors are. Uh, and we file twice a year, actually. We file unaudited mid year and we file audited at the beginning of the year. That's very good for accredited investors who want to know what they're getting into. I'll also say there are some platforms who are qualified under the regs that have used subterfuge to hide their financials from investors. And these are some of the newer platforms who've come along. They're still small and maybe they sell equity and rentals. You should really check to see how much they're disclosing because they're using a little sleight of hand not to share their full financials, which we think is irresponsible. We've been very open since the very beginning. We did the hard work early that no other platform, frankly, has done. Uh, and we have a track record that no other platform really has. Almost 3,000 loans repaid uh, on ground floor. Uh, we've returned about 10% annualized yield, and our losses are about 0.3%. So if you think about that, that's a very predictable return uh, delivered on an average of about 10 months. There's no product like it. There's no platform like it. We're also different because we're not a fund. So a lot of these platforms you go to and think, oh, I'm going to invest in private real estate deals. No, you're not. You're turning your money over to a fund manager who gets to control what's invested in what kinds of projects with what kind of risk, and also critically gets to decide, read the fine print, when you get your money back. And so if you go to redeem your money at a time that they don't want you to redeem your money, they can shut down redemptions and they do it all the time. Uh, so ground floor is very different because it's not a fund. You get to choose, you get control, and we're not dictating when you get your money back. There is a lockup, though, for most of your loans. So in other words, it's not like the stock market where I can buy a stock today and sell no, no, it no, tomorrow. No, no, no. There's a difference here, right? On our platform, we say you're investing in a loan. You're loaning money for a certain term, just like a bank would, right? And the loan is due, you know, it's say 12 months. Now, the fact is they usually repay sooner. As soon as the loan gets repaid, you're repaid. Now, the reason we have a $10 minimum, which is the lowest into the industry by about a factor of two, uh, two orders of magnitude, is because 
when there's a $10 minimum, even if you only have a thousand dollars to invest or a couple thousand dollars to invest, you can have a portfolio of a hundred or 200 loans. And what that means for you is that there's always a loan repaying, right? Maybe one loan is delayed and takes a long time to repay, but that means some other loans are always repaying on my portfolio. I'm receiving about 10 to 12% of my principal back every month. That is about 10 to 15 times what the best REIT in the world returns in terms of dividends. And I'll tell you the other big difference. That's the difference between a fund manager calling the shots and deciding when you can redeem and at what terms you can redeem and the market deciding, right? That's a huge difference. And it's not one that people are normally used to. So yeah, you are committing to the term of each loan that you invest in. But if you're doing it right, you should be investing in dozens or hundreds of loans. And it really shouldn't matter when anyone repays because there's always a certain number that are repaying. If history is pa if past is prologue, that's how it'll work out for you. Let's talk correlation because sure. last year, 2022, we had kind of an upsetting situation for investors. Yeah, yeah. It was the first year in over 50 years where not only stock market returns were negative, but bond ma market returns were negative too. And all of a sudden it gets investors thinking, what do I do if this situation happens again? Is there someplace I can invest which has a negative correlation, a good negative correlation with stocks and or bonds? So tell us about how investing in debt real estate is correlated with stocks and bonds. Well, so I think the jury is out and people will have varying opinions about the correlation of this asset class with stocks and bonds. I think if you look at ground floor's performance during this period, it's been remarkably consistent. <laughs> so while the stock market, you know, one of the big challenges we had back in 2018, 2019, and 2020, when meme stocks and cryptocurrencies were making 100% in a month or a week or even a day, you know, 10% a year looked boring, right? Uh, well, now 10% a year looks that consistent sort of tortoise beating the hare, you know, looks pretty appealing. I think what's interesting about investing in debt securities that are of short duration backed by a first lien on property is the stability and low volatility of that. So while I, I think there's very little, almost empirically, I think there's no correlation you know, to stocks and bonds. I think if one were to argue that there's some correlation, you might argue that there's negative correlation because stocks and bonds tend to trade lower when rates are increasing. And when rates are increasing, we actually offer higher rates. I'll give you an example. We were writing coupons at about 10.5% uh, in the COVID era, and now those coupons are about 12.5%. So the rate of return has increased, and we don't know what the loss ratio will be yet, right? I mean, that's that remains to be seen. As we Right now, house prices are holding up pretty well, and house prices would have to decline precipitously, even more than 2008, for this asset class to start to really um, you know, have returns compressed, net returns. So I think the jury's out. We're in a very special market right now in the macro and in uh, and in housing. I don't think any of us have, uh, even people who've been around a while like me or I don't, maybe you. Uh, you know, we haven't we haven't seen this before. You know, this we've seen we've seen different elements of the story before, but all of these elements together, it's kind of new. All I can tell investors out there is that uh, we're now writing coupons of twelve and a half percent. We don't know what the loss ratio will be, but Ground floor has just been the little engine that could, uh, you know, the tortoise against the hare. And right now it's still performing that way. We're not seeing loss ratios increase uh, markedly. We're seeing net yields continue to hold up. And that's true even though the stock and bond markets are down. Yeah, I was selling real estate actually in the early 80s. Oh, when interesting. When mortgage rates, I remember I had buyers that and the best mortgage they could get was 12 percent. people think seven percent's bad i know i know but right. of course you know in cincinnati ohio you could get a very nice house for fifty thousand right. dollars in the 80s so right. we're not going to go back there but life is uncertain markets are uncertain Clearly. as you alluded to brian history gives us some indication but it's it's not it's not a definitive um precursor to the future so i will i will say that it's good to be the bank. And if there's one, one new thing for investors to consider, it's that we've never really had the opportunity for all of us to get to be the bank, to step into the shoes of the bank and to benefit from what banks have benefited from, which is a first lien on the property, 
you know, a loan that's owed no matter what happens to the property value, you still are owed the principal and interest back on a timeline. And it's backed by real teeth where the lender ground floor can go take over that property and return the capital to the, to the investors in it. That's new and different. So we'll, we'll see how it holds up through thick and thin. So far, so good. Well, and that's the key. And as I write about for, you know, Investopedia, Forbes, US News, the risks and how to choose investments, you always look at who's behind it. True. And that's always a really, really good thing to do before you make any sort of investor. So before we wrap up, I have a couple of other questions. Okay. Give me a ballpark. What percent? And I know this is no secret. Your net worth is probably a lot greater than most of our listeners. So we're not expecting 100%. But what percent of your net worth is tied up or invested in ground floor, in ground well, floor notes? So when you're talking to the founder of a company, uh, that's a really tough question to answer because 95% of my net worth is tied up in the company's stock. So I think what you're asking about is my liquid net worth. Yes. Uh, right. The part that isn't my ground floor stock. Yeah. Uh, that, and, and that's that the hell of being reasonable. a founder, right? As, as a founder, you start these companies from nothing and all of what you own is tied up uh, sure. in your company. For sure. I got uh, that. For me, and I think it's true, we took a little, uh, our management team has about, uh, has a pretty substantial sum invested on the platform. I think if I look at my liquid net worth, I'm probably 20% allocated into ground floor notes and ground floor securities, uh, which is, you know, is a pretty good, strong allocation. I've been thinking about increasing that, frankly, um, because I believe in the product and uh, I like the way it's performed for me relative to my growth stock portfolio, for example. Uh, <laughs> Let's not, not even go good. there. Uh, and my startup portfolio is a little challenged outside of Oh, floor. yeah. Okay. So yeah, that hasn't done too well recently either. <laughs> it's, been, it's I've had some wipeouts, but that's part well, of the game. that's what comes <laughs> from being a, you know, startup investor. So right. that's, that's sure. a topic for another conversation. So well, and that's another that's another thing we did with Ground Floor, by the way, is we opened up ownership of the company itself to our customers. In fact, our customers now own 31% of Ground really? Floor stock. Yeah. Really? So is that an ongoing opportunity or is that um, we open it up about every two years uh okay. for new investors to participate? Uh the last one we did was last fall, so probably a year and a half from now. I would expect we'll do that again. And then once you're a shareholder, we also allow people every year to increase their ownership and we're currently running a campaign that's seeing, looks like it's going to end up with probably a million dollars uh, invested by our base. And, you know, we love that because our, our customers own the company. That's uh, a wonderful model. And that really, that really says a lot for your customer base. So one last question, what are the biggest risks in both the crowdfunding industry in general and in ground floor in particular? So I think in the industry in particular, one of the risks that has to be paid attention to is platform risk. Platform risk is the risk that the entity that is offering these securities and managing them, uh, that it survives long enough to see through the end of the investment. So if you're looking at some of these newer crowdfunding companies who've just come on the scene with a lot of hype in the last year or two, especially, especially if they're funded by Silicon Valley, I think you have to be very careful in investing with those companies because we don't know whether they'll be around for the long term. And if they're not along, around for the long term, we don't actually know what will happen to the investment capital that went into them. I think that's especially true because the vast majority of these companies do not disclose their financials. You don't get to know what their profit and loss is, what their cash flow is, or what their balance sheet is. And I think that is a travesty because platform risk is number one. And you can go look and see, we entered this year with more cash on hand than we've ever had, or as financially strong as we've ever been. And you may decide that our platform is risky or not, uh, but you can at least know the risk you're taking. So that's number one. I think, especially for crowdfunded investments in this still nascent industry, uh, there are a lot of newcomers in it. Uh, all kinds of cool stuff. You know, you can invest fractionally in art and you can buy a share of wine. You can, uh, you can uh, of, of, of a wine collection. You can buy uh, collectibles. You, could, you can invest in all kinds of things, but you better know, to your point, you know, what is the risk of the platform that's managing these investments? Secondly, uh, I think in crowdfunding investments, you need to pay attention very closely to how the deals are vetted uh, and who is doing the vetting and how they are going about managing those assets. The best advice I got when starting Ground Floor, when I started Ground Floor, I'd never really done any real estate finance. I wasn't a real estate guy. 
you know, I had to learn real estate and I had a lot of smart people that we hired and became advisors and investors in the company who taught me a lot. One of the first things they taught was the importance of asset management. It's easy to lend money out. It's a hell of a lot harder to get it back. And we learned that the hard way in some cases, because we made some mistakes in the early years, uh, but we became very adept at managing the assets. And I would ask hard questions about, okay, I've invested, now what? And what's going to happen over time? And what is the level of diligence that's put into what happens after the money's invested? And how much information do I get as an investor? I think that part of crowdfunding, your mileage will vary a lot between platforms in that. And I think people would do well to pay close attention to it. Okay, we've got two minutes to go. And you kind of skirted the issue, Ooh, Brian, which, issue? which is what are the risks of ground uh, floor? It. Yes, the risks with ground floor, number one risk is concentration risk. So if you put all your eggs in a couple of loans that you like, you are taking risk on our platform and it is very difficult to predict where your returns will end up, right? If you invest only in the riskiest loans, right? That have the highest leverage. Those are the loans that are most likely to go into foreclosure. When loans go into foreclosure, foreclosure can be expensive. And when foreclosure is expensive, that incurs the risk of loss. Now you can go to our blog and you can look every month. We publish what loans were repaid, what percentage rate was you know repaid relative to what was expected. We detail all the losses you know that happen and you can learn from that, right? So the two big risks on ground floor are number one, concentration, which you can control because our minimum is $10. That's why it's $10. So you can control that. And I highly advise people, I'm not giving advice, but if I were, I'd say diversify, find your own strategy and pursue it. And secondly, uh, definitely don't concentrate on only the riskiest loans, because if you do that, you're at risk of foreclosure and loss. And those are the two big risks. Wise advice, not only for investing with ground floor, but for investing across your entire portfolio. Be diversified. Don't put all of your money in one stock or two stocks, especially if you learned about it on Reddit, because then you are doomed for failure. Brian, I loved hearing your thoughts. You are so smart, and I love learning more about the platform. If the listeners want to learn more, we'll put some links down at the bottom. And thank you so much for coming on. It was a true pleasure. Oh, you're most welcome. And thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Great. Appreciate it.